I do have handouts for this week, so make sure you get a handout. <coughs> I debated whether I, w to wait until after the class to give you these, because I don't want you kind of moving ahead and missing miss what I'm saying, but um, I figure this way you can kind of take notes along with me. So Father Larry had the the handouts if, if anyone needs one. <coughs> well, let's let's go ahead and get started. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that you have given us in the resurrection, and we pray, Lord, that as we contemplate uh, our own death and the death of those we love, that we might look ahead to how we might be a witness to the reality of that hope that we have. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so quick review from sort of the things that we talked about last week. Remember that creation is good, so the, the world is not this evil place that we're trying to cast off in favor of the spiritual realm. And as, as Christians, we know that death has entered the world through sin, but it is an enemy of God, an enemy of the world. And because of what Christ has done, it is a conquered enemy. And because it's a conquered enemy, we are free to name it for what it is. And uh, we also remember that our ultimate telos, our ultimate purpose, is not simply a spiritual existence in heaven, but rather it is resurrection to the new heaven and the new earth. And so what we're going to look at today is how does what we do in the burial service point to the hope that we have. Um, so often today we have Christians and we see what they're doing in their funeral services. It's, it doesn't sync up with what our Christian hope is. And this is our last, perhaps our last opportunity to be a witness to what it is that we believe and what it is that we hope for. So we're going to explore all of those things, or at least some of those things today. And the first thing I want to talk about is there has been this move culturally. Um, death is a taboo. You don't talk about it in polite society, in polite conversation. And so we don't even say that someone died. We say they passed away. And we don't have funerals anymore. We have celebrations of life. And my, my very first meeting um, at Christ the King, I was told, well, we have some celebrations of life that we have to do. And I said, that's a problem because I don't do celebrations of life. Uh, number one, that is not a service in the prayer book. And as an Anglican priest, I am bound to uh, administer the sacraments of the church and the liturgies of the church through the prayer book. Um, but there's a, there's a bigger issue with this idea of celebration of life. So again, it's this way of ignoring the reality of death. Uh, and we think if we ignore it, maybe it'll go away. And so what we do is we have a big celebration and we look back on what, who the person was and what they did. And, and there are some, that in and of itself is not a bad thing. Uh, and there are wonderful times of remembrance that we can have. I remember the, the former rector of the church I served in Missouri died while I was there. And there were, there were probably 20 of us in his room um, shortly after he died. And we just spent hours telling stories and remembering him. And it was this incredibly holy time together. But that's not what the burial service does. Um, so where the celebration of life ignores the reality of death and looks back on the person's life, the Anglican burial service um, actually confronts the reality of death head on. So we acknowledge that death is a reality. Um, and because we acknowledge it, we can talk about it. And we can talk about it 
because we know that through Christ we have victory over it. Okay, if, if you've read the Harry Potter books, in the beginning of Harry Potter, they won't say Voldemort's name. He's the big enemy. And everyone refers to Voldemort as he who must not be named. And the reason for this is because Voldemort has power over them, and so they can't use his name. Um, Harry comes, and Harry's not afraid of Voldemort, because Harry knows he has power over him, and so he's not afraid to use his name. So we shouldn't be afraid to, to, to speak of because although it is a foe, we know it is a conquered foe. And so here's, here's my first encouragement. Please do not use euphemisms when talking about death. Okay? It is okay to say that someone has died. We don't have to say they passed on or they passed away or they expired we, we can name death for what it is because we know that we have the hope that death is a conquered enemy. And so the burial service looks forward to life in God's presence and resurrection at the end of the age. And so the burial service in the prayer book is an Easter service. Okay, so we don't wear black. We actually wear white because it is a celebration of resurrection and the hope that we have in the midst of grief. So we acknowledge both of those in the burial office. We acknowledge grief. We acknowledge that we're but we also acknowledge that we have hope in the resurrection. So I won't do celebrations of life. Only do the burial of the dead. <laughs> yeah. So, next question, should a funeral service be held in a church? Well, I, I think, practically speaking, when possible, yes. Because this is sort of a, a Christian family witness, and so we ought to do it um, with where the family gathers. Uh, however, if space or location is an issue, you can do it any place. Any place can become sacred space when the people of God gather together um, to worship the Lord. So one of the one of the disadvantages to our wonderful space here is it tends to be a little small. Um, and for those of you who were here for uh, Barbara Eddingfield's funeral, we packed this place to the gills. If if one more person had shown up, they might not have fit. Um, but you don't have to have a funeral service in a church. Now, if, if there's a church, if a church is available, it's better to use the church than the funeral home, um, especially if, you know, it's going to be a lot of people from the worshiping community gathering together. All right. Can the committal take place before the burial itself? Yes. So I, I know in... Um, a world of sort of practical things. Sometimes you want to wait to do the actual funeral service till you can gather people together. So you can actually do the committal where you commit the body or the ashes to the ground. You can do that first and then do the burial service after. Um, traditionally, it's done, you have the burial service, and back in the old days, you would process out into the graveyard. All churches had graveyards, and you would commit the body at that point. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to follow like that. And also, you can do the committal. Um, it doesn't have to be immediately after the service. You can do it later. I know, especially for military people, if they're going to be buried in um, a national cemetery or a veteran cemetery, sometimes you've got to line those things up. Um, so those are those are two parts of the service that can be done in either order, and there can be time in between. <coughs> so next question, why is the casket closed and covered? So that's actually one of the rubrics in the prayer book, is that for a funeral service where there is a body present, the body must, the, the casket must be closed, and it must be covered. So why do we do this? Well, there's, there's two reasons why we do this. Um, 
The first one is even though the burial service is for the individual, the focus of the burial service is actually not on the person who has died. The focus of the service is Jesus. And so we want to do everything we can to keep the focus on Jesus. Um, The reason we cover the casket is because um, it, there's a there's a big industry around death and funerals, and if you've ever shopped for caskets, you know that there is a huge sort of disparity between something that is very simple and something very plain, and something that's very opulent and expensive. We have a beautiful pall, so this cover that you see on the screen that's called a pall. That's where we get term pallbearers. Uh, a pall covers the casket, and when we do that, every casket looks the same, whether it was $500 or $15,000. And so it's a way of showing that there's no status in God's kingdom, that we all enter God's kingdom as fellow heirs with Christ. So the, the casket is closed and covered for those reasons. Now, what about flowers and pictures? Um, I I, I will say I've probably made a a few people mad at me for my position on flowers and pictures at at wedding or at funerals and weddings, for that matter. Um, Again, the focus of the service is on Jesus, and we need to make sure that everything we do keeps that focus on Jesus. And what I have seen, again, there's a huge industry built up around things like weddings and funerals. And I've been to enough funerals where all the florists are competing for the prime space and the biggest arrangement, and it winds up looking like a jungle in the church. But what all of this is doing is it's, it's taking the attention off the reason while you're actually there. Um, so my my rules for funerals are you can have two arrangements, and I actually have uh, size. You can't be taller than this, wider than this. They can go on either side of the cross, and that's it. All other flowers outside where people can look at them and enjoy them. Um, but But there's also sort of a personal reason behind this. I was doing a funeral once many years ago for a young man, in his 20s who had died. And, and as you know, the younger the person, the larger the service. And this, we, the nave was packed, the um, parish hall was packed with people watching a video feed, and we processed in, and I noticed that there were even people sitting in the clergy seat. So I suddenly realized I wasn't going to have anywhere to sit. Um, and they had flowers all over the place, and we had uh, an altar rail Um, with a small opening in the altar rail, and they had put these two huge arrangements on either side of the altar rail. So I did the first part of the service, but then when the rector went to preach the homily, I said, well, I probably shouldn't be standing up here, so I was going to kind of sneak out, go stand in the side aisle. And this was a small space. There was less space between the altar platform and the front pew than we have here at Christ the King. But as I'm going through the opening, my surplus catches this stick coming out of the arrangement, knocks it over, and if that's all that had happened, it would have been okay, but the, the bottom of this vase busts open, all this water starts gushing out onto the feet of the family in the front row. I, I am not an easily embarrassed person, but I just wanted the world to open up and suck me down into it at that point. Um, but, but you see where when you have all these flowers, there's this potential to take the focus off of where it should be, which is the hope of the resurrection. Um, so, so flowers are beautiful. We can have them outside. We can have them in the parish hall where people can see them and enjoy them. But I'm not going to allow the chancel to be competition space for florists. Um, And the same with pictures 
again, we'll, we'll, put it, we'll usually put a picture of the, the person who has died on the cover of the bulletin. Um, but we don't want to have it up in the worship space because, again, we're not worshiping the person who has died. We're worshiping Jesus who has died for us. All right, what kind of music is appropriate at a funeral? Um, hymns and contemporary Christian music are wonderful. It's, it's interesting. Anglicans quickly become Baptists at their funerals, and suddenly we start singing these Baptist hymns that we don't normally sing. Um, I, I actually have a list of great funeral songs that, um, that focus, again, on Easter and the resurrection and the hope that we have in Christ. Um, secular music ought to be avoided at funerals. Um, I, I will say secular music is not allowed. So, so if, you, if you love the Bette Midler song, because you always know that you're my hero, you can love that song. We're not going to sing it in church. We're not going to sing the Michael Buble song in church. Um, so there, there are a number of sentimental sort of quasi-religious songs that, that people want to put in there. But again, it, it shifts the focus. And this is not about sentimentalism. It's, it's about proclaiming our hope in Christ. Um, so Easter songs are great. Songs that focus on the resurrection. And again, I have on the, the form that we're on um, to help plan your own service. There's a whole list of, of music. Um, and if you have the electronic version of the document, there's links to YouTube videos for all the songs so you can see. Um, <coughs> all right. One of the things you may notice is in the Anglican burial service, there is not a place for eulogies. We do not eulogize in the service. Um, and again, a couple reasons for that. Number one, what is the focus of the burial service? Jesus. So we're going to have a homily where, where the officiant or the celebrant is going to proclaim the gospel. And we'll oftentimes bring in some things about the person who's died and, and talk about their faith and how their faith sustain them in their life, but this is not the time to talk about all the things that they accomplished in their life because we're not talking about the past, we're looking at the future and what they are doing now in service in God's kingdom. Um, and I've also found that uh, doing eulogies and remembrances works a lot better after the service, during the reception where it's a little less formal and people can come up and share, um, and and you don't, you know, you never know what someone's going to say. <laughs> I, I've always said you should never do open eulogizing in a family that has drinking problems. So, <laughs> yeah, I'd, you learn that you learn that lesson the hard way. So, <laughs> um, so so we will have a sermon but we will not do eulogies during the burial service. Now, here's an interesting question. Should there be communion at a funeral? Um, <clears throat> this may shock you, but oftentimes I say no. Now, here's why. <laughs> and that's a good question. If, if the funeral is mostly church members, I think it's wonderful, wonderfully appropriate. When we did the funeral service for the previous rector in my last church, um, we absolutely had communion because this was a room full of Anglicans and Christians, and it was a wonderful celebration. But what I've often seen with funerals, and, and I, I make the same recommendation for weddings as well, is you have a lot of people coming in who may not be Christian, who may not be Anglican. And so what communion does often is it confuses people. They're not sure what it is. They're not sure what we're doing. They're not sure if they're invited. Um, my, uh, my, at my nephew's wedding uh, a number of years ago, uh, my sister's family is Catholic. And 
So they had their wedding in the Catholic Church, and they had communion. And the priest literally said before the Eucharistic prayer, if you are Catholic, please kneel and continue. If you're not Catholic, just sit there and be quiet. And, and so it was very clear that this part was not for all of us there. Um, <clears throat> so I, I will never tell someone they can't have communion at a, at a burial service, but th- it's something to consider that um, communion is sort of, it's a family dinner. And, and when, when you do a family dinner with, with people who might not be part of the family, um, it can sometimes come off as not very welcoming because suddenly you're excluding people. Uh, and we want to keep the focus on Jesus. Okay, what about the body? (laughs) Here's where it's really going to get interesting. Okay, so for this discussion, we need to remember that this is primarily about our Christian witness and the hope that we have in Jesus. It is not about God's ability or inability to raise us to new life if we do something rather than something else, okay? So I'm not saying, well, you can't get cremated because then God can't raise you from the dead. No, God can, God is God. He is going to raise us from the dead no matter what we do. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I often, I often say, you know, I'll, I'll often tell people, you really believe in a weak Holy Spirit, don't you? Because, well, if, the priest doesn't hold his hands just so, then, then it doesn't become the body and blood of Christ. I'm like, what Holy Spirit are you worshiping? <laughs> he, he, can, he can do what he wants despite what we do. Okay? So, this is, so this is not about God's ability or inability to do anything. It's about what is our witness? How does how we treat our own bodies and the bodies of our loved ones, how does that speak in witness to what we believe and what our hope is. So remember, our hope is not simply in going and living forever in heaven as a spiritual being, but rather our hope is ultimately in the resurrection of our bodies. It is a physical and a spiritual existence. So so the physical is eternal. Now it's, it's different. Remember, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he, he was physical, but somehow he was changed. Um, but we can't lose sight of the physicality of our hope when it comes to resurrection. So that even the physical world, our belief is the world will not be destroyed, but it will be redeemed. Because the world was created good, so God does not need to destroy the world. His, his ultimate plan for creation is to redeem the physical world. <clears throat> so burial has always been the preferred method for how Christians deal with the body. Um, and even if you look uh, back at, at old cemeteries, they will be set so that all the bodies are facing east. And the idea was when Christ returns, he comes from the east. And so those who rise from the grave will rise facing Jesus. Um, And that was a witness to what Christians believed a long time ago. (coughs) So what about cremation? And I think, especially in our world today, creation has become more of a practical reality. Um, one One of the downsides... One of the downsides of burial is that it it requires a lot of land, and and land is perhaps one of the most valuable resources that we have. And so we've seen a move probably in the past hundred years or so where more Christians are being cremated. So is is that acceptable for Christians? Well, there are some who would say no. I know specifically the Eastern Orthodox will refuse to do cremation. I, there, there's no prohibition within Scripture against 
country nation. The Anglican Church has no prohibition on cremation either. And so I, I believe cremation is perfectly acceptable. We say, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so we're just kind of speeding the process up a bit. Um, but to say that God cannot raise ashes from the dead, again, I, I believe in a much more powerful God than that. Um, so, so cremation is, for many of us, a much more practical reality. However, if we choose cremation, um, the question then becomes, how should the remains be handled? And this is probably where I'm going to get into trouble with some of you. <laughs> so the, the remains should be either buried or interred in a, in a columbarium. Okay, um, so I served in a church where we had a garden, and we would dig a hole, and we would pour the, the ashes into the hole and bury it, and we had a, a little chart that showed where everyone was in the, in the garden. Um, I served in another church where we had a columbarium, which was a big wall with niches, and we would put the ashes in the niches. Um, the reason we want to do this is, again, we're, we're speaking to that reality of resurrection and our hope in the resurrection. Um, <clears throat> and so things like scattering our ashes, it's, I know a lot of Christians want to do that, but, but it's that witnesses to the, a pagan hope that we're just sort of sus assumed back into the universe and we become part of the universe and may become a tree or a turtle or something like that. Um, it's this idea that once the body has died, the body is done. And that's not what we believe as Christians. We believe our bodies will be raised. And so we ought to do something that acknowledges that reality. Um, another thing that I won't do is separate the ashes. Because again, we want, to, we want to understand that the body is important. Even after death, the body is still important. And so we need to treat that body as a unity in recognition of our hope that that body will be raised. Okay? Um, so I, I know we had a, have a question, Sue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ocean and Father Larry and I talked about this because there is, there is, okay, yeah. So the question is what about um, scattering ashes in the ocean, especially here where there are a lot of Navy people. So burial at sea is a thing, um, especially you know, back in the old days when, when people would die on a ship, you, you couldn't just keep the body on the ship, so they would bury the body at sea. What I would say is if you would like to do burial at sea to, and, and you're going to do cremation to, again, keep the ashes together. Don't scatter them, but you can, you, can, you can drop the ashes in a container into the ocean. Um, but again, this, this idea that, that our bodies will be raised. So what are we doing with our body to show that we believe that our bodies will be raised. And part of that is keeping those bodies as together as, as possible. James. Right. Okay. So, yes. So, so James said, oh, I assumed we were getting new bodies. Well, the, the answer to that is yes and no. So Jesus, <coughs> um, when they went to the tomb on Easter... Jesus' body was gone. Now, Jesus had risen from the dead. That was still his body. It was changed. And so it's not necessarily new bodies, but rather changed bodies. Incorruptible. And, and so it's not that we get something brand new so we can get rid of the old because that was physical and that was evil. Our bodies are still part of who we are. Remember, as Christians, we're not dualists. We believe that body and soul are intertwined, that our bodies are just as much who we are as our souls are. And so 
So a recognition of that, that, okay, we're going we're gonna to make sure our bodies are together in, in recognition of that hope that those bodies, these bodies that we have will be raised. They will be different, but we're not, we don't get to go get a brand new body. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, JP. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and, and again, JP, I'm not saying that we're doing this because we're trying to help God out, but it's a witness to what we believe. So I, 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 I recognize that there are times when that can't happen, okay? But we shouldn't be doing things intentionally against that, okay? Does that make sense? So, so the question becomes, what is our witness? Um, if, if someone dies in war from a bomb, that certainly wasn't their intention. Um, and God can still raise them from the dead. But I'm not going to ask for my ashes to be scattered at Disneyland because, <laughs> because that doesn't speak to my Christian hope in the resurrection. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, so I've, I've had people say, well, I want my ashes. So the question is, what do I mean by not to separate the ashes? I've had people who they want their ashes, some of them taken and put in North Carolina and other ashes in California and some other ashes in New Mexico. Um, we ought to keep our ashes together in recognition of the unity of our bodies. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So our 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 ashes <laughs> again, my my recommendation is our ashes ought to be buried or interred uh in recognition of the hope that we have in the resurrection. So again, this is our witness. Are, are we witnessing to what we believe in? Um, you know, if I say uh, that, <laughs> if, I, if I'm a police officer and I say, I believe speed limits are important and they save lives, and I constantly drive 80 miles an hour through neighborhoods, my actions don't match up with what I say I believe. And so the question becomes, do our actions, do our intentions match what we say we believe in? Okay. Um, so what about donating our bodies to science? And that, that's actually an interesting question because as, as Christians, we also believe that life is sacred and life is important. And that's actually a way that, that we show the sanctity of life by giving of our bodies to, to help make life better for others. Um, so I am not opposed to organ donation or donating our bodies to science or things like that. One of the things I do recommend, I've known a number of people who have donated their bodies to science, and there are organizations that will um, cremate the body after they're done using it and return it to the family. And so if there's a way to do that, that's always good because then – Again, you have the body, you can do the burial, you have the service, and things like that. So again, this is not about God's ability, it's about what is our witness to what we believe. Maureen. Yes. Yes, so, so Maureen said, yes. Right. If, if you're going to do burial at sea with ashes, you make sure it's weighed. And that's one of the things Father Larry and I have talked about before. Yeah, you got to make sure it's it's weighted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. 
Right, so what Babs is saying oftentimes, if, if you're donating your body to science, you can have the funeral service as soon as possible, and then when the ashes are returned 10 months, a year later, then you do the, the internment. Um, so th those don't have to happen close to each other. There can be distance. Yes. Right. Okay, Ruthie. Right, so the difference between the burial office, um, <coughs> there's, a, there's a part of the burial. So the question is, what about uh, memorial services? So the, the burial service in the prayer book has a section at the end called the commendation, where you essentially commit the body um, to a, its final resting place. If the body isn't present for some reason, um, you can do the whole first part of the service simply without the commendation. Um, <coughs> and it essentially serves as a memorial service, but we still call it the burial of the dead. Okay? All right, we'll, we'll go through a few more things because we're running low on time, and then I, I will take more questions. So <coughs> next thing is about remembering the church. Um, you know, this this one of the things that, that we're experiencing at, at Christ the King, that there can be economic impacts to the church when we lose our members. Um, and so we always want to encourage people to remember um, the church in your wills and in your estate planning. And there are lots of ways you can do that. <coughs> um, it can be a one-time bequest. People have established trusts or endowments. Um, but this can really help to not only relieve the financial burden on the church family, but also can be used as a way to leave a legacy in the church for future generations. Um, and gifts can be general or they can be specific. Uh, there are some dangers in giving specifically. Um, <clears throat> one of the dangers is if, if it's too specific, it may get to a point where that money can no longer be used because the situation it was given for is, is no longer available. Um, and I can tell you horror stories about that, uh, but not now. And the last thing I want to talk about is Christian grieving. So again, um, death is a taboo. We don't talk about it. And because it's a taboo, grieving is also a taboo. We're not supposed to do it in public. Um, people will tell you, oh, you've, you've got to be strong. Or, or people will say, <coughs> well, I'm, I'm too sad to come to church. Um, this idea that, well, I can't cry in church. And I've, I've told many of you, if you can't cry in church, you, where can you cry? So, so the first thing I want to say is this is a safe place to grieve. Um, because, again, we're not ignoring the reality of death. And the reality of death is that it is sad. When we lose, we're, we're not sad <coughs> for them, but we are sad for us. Because we've lost that person. They're no longer part of our life. And so it, it is okay to grieve. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to cry. It is okay to miss that person tremendously. And so give yourself permission to grieve. So often what happens is we put it off, we ignore it, we ignore it, we ignore it, and then we don't deal with it. We don't process it. So it's okay to grieve, but as Christians, we always grieve with hope. And so it is grief without despair. Because we know that there's a future beyond this life and this world. That, that one day we will be raised. And, and we're not all just going to be sort of assumed into this big generic godness of the world where we lose our personality and our individuality. That that will all be part of God's kingdom and part of our resurrected bodies. And so when we grieve, we grieve knowing that it is not the end and that we will one day be reunited with our loved ones in God's kingdom. 
And so we can have joy in that in the midst of our current grief. James. Okay, so, so James's question is, um, are there any problems going to the grave and um, remembering anniversaries and things like that? Absolutely not. That's all part of the healthy grieving process. Uh, we believe in the communion of saints, um, so, so it's okay to, to talk to and remember our loved ones. Um, now, we need to make sure we're not praying to them or worshiping them. But, but it's absolutely okay to, <clears throat> to remember them and, and talk with them. And, and that's all part of the reality of confronting death. Um, so th that's all very healthy and actually can be very helpful. And, and that's part of the reason why when we, when we bury someone or, or inter them in a specific location, it gives us a place to go to, to do those sorts of things. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, grief is not a place, it is a process. And for, for some of us, it takes longer to work through um, than others, and, and it depends on the relationship. If, if you are married to someone for 60 years, you know, that's not going to be a fast process. We're not going to snap our fingers, and all of a sudden, you feel great again. Um, that, that's going to be a lifetime. Now, it, it gets easier over time, but you're never going to stop missing that person. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you lose a, a child, you are never going to stop grieving. <laughs> you might get to a point where you're not crying every day, but, um, but we don't want to forget about it. We don't want to just put it aside and put it in a drawer. Um, so, so be okay with grief. I've got a a good friend, um, and his dad died um, a couple years ago, and and he talked to me two days before the anniversary of his dad's death, and I said, you know what, take the day off from work, and just be sad that day. It's okay. That's that's what we do. Um, confront it, acknowledge it, be in the grief, and then you can go back to work the next day. But you don't want to ignore it. Okay, Bab. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so um, Bab's point is sometimes people get stuck in grief, and so I th there's a difference between grief and despair. Um, so despair, and and that's why I talk about. Grief with with hope, because a, a ho grief with hope moves kind of through that grief, remembering that that we will see that person again. If if you're stuck, and that grief doesn't seem to change, or you don't seem to be moving through it, then that's a time when maybe you need to talk to a counselor or a clergy person to help move through that. But I think what happens in our culture. <coughs> is we see grief is bad, and so you're sad, and we're like, oh my gosh, you can't be sad. We need to give you a pill so you're not sad. And so we don't allow that person to be sad. Um, so yeah, you, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, absolutely. Elaine. Yes. M there are many great grief support resources, um, and oftentimes talking about it, and especially talking about it with other people um, who have experienced the same thing can be really helpful, really therapeutic. And again, it's a way of addressing it rather than ignoring it and hoping it'll go away. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Again, I, 
I, the, the question was, is it all right to say this person graduated to heaven? I will not say that. Again, I, I think we can't be afraid to use the word death. Anytime we use a euphemism, we're sort of skirting the issue. Um, and again, our, our ultimate goal is actually not heaven, but it's the kingdom of God and the renewed heaven and the renewed earth. And so we don't want to give that sense that they're there and it's done because it's not. We still have something that we hope for. Leah. Oh. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I just, right, I just, I want to encourage us to not be afraid to name death for what it is. Yes. Leah. Yeah. Yep. And and I think so so Leah is saying don't be afraid to talk to someone about death. Um and I think we have this sense that well I can't mention the person who died because it might make the other person sad. Well, it it might yes, it might make them sad, but but that's okay. And and I think part of the gift of the Christian community is it gives us people to grieve with us. And grief can be a really lonely place um, and a really lonely process. And so I encourage you to allow other people to enter into that with you and don't be afraid to enter into grief with other people. Okay, Mary Carol. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so Sue's point is sometimes you might feel guilty because you don't feel like you're grieving enough. Um, th- there's no such thing as an appropriate amount of grief. Um, typically, someone that you're around every day, you're going to feel it a lot more and a lot more differently than if you have a loved one that lives in another state that you don't see as often. Um, so so don't, don't ever think that there's a right amount of grief. Um, we always, we grieve differently for different people at different points in our lives. So allow yourself to grieve however your body wants to grieve. Um, and don't feel that either you're too sad or, or you're not sad enough. Mm-hmm. Right. So always, always grieving with hope. Trey. <laughs> the summer of death. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you, Trey. So, so Trey, Trey just wanted to thank us for for tackling this subject. And, and I know it's a hard thing to talk about, but one of the things I'm trying to do is break the taboo. Let's let's be okay talking about death amongst each other, and and that helps to soften the blow. Kathy. Yes, yes. So there's there's <laughs> there's lots of bad things. So um, Kathy was saying um, her her parents lost a young child, and someone told her that, told the her mom that if she wasn't baptized, she wasn't going to go to be with Jesus. She said, no, no, no. That's completely wrong. First of all, that's not our call to make. That is above our pay grade. Um, <coughs> I, I I fully believe in the grace of God and um, and and actually now I know in the Catholic Church they have what's known as baptism of intention. So if a child dies before he or she is baptized, but the the intention of the parents was to baptize that child. Um, but again, baptism is not what saves us. It's Jesus that saves us, and so I put my trust in him. All right, we'll do, we'll do one more question, and then we'll stop the recording, but I'll stay as long as, as you guys want for questions. So, Sabrina. And this, maybe we need another class on the theology of baptism, but that'll be for another time. So we're going we're gonna to stop the recording, but I will, I'll stick around as long as people want to ask questions. If, if you need to get home or, or get to the restaurant, you are free to go, but also feel free to stick around with any more questions.